Welcome to Oil Painting Question and Answers, episode number 14. Uh, before I get into today's questions, I want to teach a little lesson on plotting key points. And uh, just let me first of all touch on the way that I teach is to uh, first start off, no matter what you're drawing, and put two what I call golden lines on your canvas. That's a single vertical uh, line, uh, just anywhere across your subject matter. Um, and if you're, and, and then a horizontal line. For detailed instruction on how to draw your golden lines, go to the online course at drawmixpaint.com, chapter four. And whether you're working from life or working from a photograph, uh, you'll find the instruction there on how to get your golden lines right because it's very important. It's the foundation for all your reference so that if you want to know where do I paint this apple, well you measure from the golden line, you measure to the right edge of the apple, and then you go to your canvas where you've also drawn those same golden lines and you plot the left edge of the apple. Simple as that. So you start by plotting points. Just like in this silver here, I've plotted all the points that I can, uh, that I can measure, and uh, especially the ones that have hard, sharp edges or sharp marks or lines that I can see very clearly. And I've plotted every one of those points, measuring from the bottom golden line and from the golden line on the right and plotting each one of those points. And then once I've plotted all the points, then I put in a very small line indicating the angle at each one of those points. And some of those points have two angles. But once I get all the angles put in after the points, then the last thing to do, which is really not very difficult, is to put in the curves to finish the drawing. And that gives you a very simple line drawing that you can then use to paint from. That's basically how you pencil and plot points, angles, and curves. First points, then angles, then curves. And you don't have to do all the points and then all the angles and then draw in all the curves. What you can do is, you know, if you're painting an eye, for instance, you may plot four points and then draw a little bit of a curve in and just go ahead and finish the eye. But in general, I like to plot all the points, then the angles, and then the curves. And by the way, you can use your proportional divider to check angles like I talk about in this clip here. You guys know how to check an angle with one of these? You just hold it out. This one's vertical, and this one checks the angle, right? This one's vertical, and this one, you got a book sitting on a table. I want to know what that angle is. Come over here, draw it in, check it. Okay, so now what about key points? Key points are a little different. If you take a look at this still life here, um, I've plotted a few what I think are key points. And, and you, could, there's, you, know, you could pick a different set. It doesn't have to be these specific key points. But these little marks that I've put on the canvas, I'm going to make really sure, number one, that I plot them correctly and that they're very accurately marked and so that I know when I look at the artichoke and I want to know where the top of the artichoke is, I can count on that line. But just keep in mind what key points that you're plotting and, and those points are points you never want to lose. In other words, as you start to paint the, the, the cup or a plum or the artichoke, you know, you bump the line around and next thing you know you've moved the top of the artichoke up a little bit or, or whatever it is. But if you have these key points, you can always go back and remeasure with your proportional divider. In other words, if I know where the top of the artichoke is and I've made a little mark on my canvas and you can leave a little spot of bare canvas or whatever you have to do or, you know, put a little mark with paint, but don't touch that mark and you can, that way you know exactly where the top of your artichoke is and when you're doing the rest of your still life you know you can go back to the golden lines and measure but by having that indication of where the top of the artichoke is and where the left edge of the artichoke is that tells you where does the plumb line up it tells you how much of a gap there is between the mug and the artichoke and so it's just a visual reference so let's look at this sky that i took the other day out at the uh, geneva fine arts uh, paint shop and even in a sky like this that's pretty abstract where you don't have any, you know, if you look at the whole sky, there's just nothing, there's not any particular objects that you can put. It doesn't matter, but just make a few key points. An edge of a cloud, you know, the bottom of, of, of one cloud, the cloud over on the left, put little marks where you know where those little edges are. And if I was going to pencil this and I was going to do something abstract, 
like this sky here, what I would do is instead of drawing in the whole sky or taking a bunch of time to measure all these points and all these lines, is I would just start off by putting in a few key points like I've indicated here and then just freehand the rest of it. Maybe by have, and, and if you'll notice, I've spread those key points out. They're not all clumped in one spot. They're just, there's one on the left, there's one on the far right, you know, there's one in the middle. And, and by having those and putting those in, it's not very hard to sort of connect the dots and get the rest of the sky painted in without really um, spending a lot of time with it. So have a few key points and that'll help you to not only uh, not lose those points as you paint, but also just to start with and to, to use those key points to draw in something abstract like this sky here. Okay, so now let's talk about portraits. And first of all, when I do portraits, instead of just having two golden lines, I will go ahead and draw in an entire box. And you can make maybe the left line and the bottom line be your real hard, solid golden lines and then put in the other two just as reference. But by having that box, it really helps. And notice where I put the box, right above the eyebrows, right underneath the chin, and then just on the left side and right side of her face. And those lines are really my solid golden line that I can trust. And if I lose my likeness later, I can always go back and look at my golden line. So I always try to leave a little bit of the golden line and don't paint over the whole thing so I can maintain that visual reference. But now let's look at the face. You don't have to pick the exact same uh, key points that I have here, but I've tried to zoom in on the real essential ones and this is all about getting a likeness. You know, you can pencil so many different ways. You don't even have to use my method for penciling with golden lines, but, but if you're, when you're doing a portrait, it is unlike anything else because you have to get this likeness and it is so easy if the eye if you paint the eye just a millimeter to the left or to the right uh, from where it should be the likeness will be off so especially in a portrait uh, through my uh, long career painting portraits where it was getting a likeness was so important um, you know the client would never be happy if the likeness was even the slightest bit off so I would always have these key point references. And so just make note of all the spots where I've put a little mark. When I work and I'm painting in the eye, I really, really try not to move that, that key point. I do not want the left edge of my eye to move. And it's so easy to sit there and work on an eye and play with it and play with it. And before you notice it, you've moved the edge up a little bit or to the left a little bit or, wh or whatever. So by having these key points and when you plot them in and when you paint, try not to lose them. Try not to paint over them quickly where now you've sort of lost your reference. Work carefully and slowly. You don't have to do it exactly like, like I did, but it's always good to have some, some key points that while you're working, you're very careful that you don't bump it around. You know, when I'm painting in the eye, or the bottom of the nose or whatever, I'm just so careful that I'm not going to move that line around as I work and it's real easy to do. So I hope that's helpful um, as far as uh, key points go and, and drawing and uh, so now let's get into some questions. Can you do a demonstration of a seascape or paint water? Um, I don't have any current plans to, to do that, to do a demonstration on painting water but I think that's a great idea and something I should do uh, you know, before too long. Um, I will say that painting water is no different than painting you know, fabric or, or skin or, or a rock. I mean, it really doesn't matter. It's a matter of checking your values, not blending, um, laying your colors in boldly. You know, it's, it's the very same um, way you would paint anything else. Um, and uh, sometimes the one thing about water is there's a lot of darks mixed with lights. You know, you have the reflection on top of the water and then you have the very dark shadows. So it might be a little more difficult because you really have to be careful not to let your whites and your lighter colors milk up your dark shadow colors. So really it's just a matter of doing the very same things that I always teach about not blending, not polluting your shadows. The very same thing applies to painting water 
um, if not especially so. Let me show you a painting that my cameraman uh, Kay in Hawaii when I was living there and we were doing some filming and doing this reality TV show and Kay decided that he wanted to uh, paint and so this is his very first oil painting I'm sorry, this is his second oil painting. First he did a still life and then he did this uh, ocean scene and I just thought it was fantastic. I love your technique of laying out your palette, but I'm confused. What I can't figure out is after you get your steps set up and are ready to paint, how do you know which basic colors and or combinations of steps to choose from to paint a particular spot on the painting? And after you have mixed so many steps and are ready to paint, how do you remember where each step originated from on the source of the painting? Uh, yeah, there's a simple answer to that, and that is, uh, it's not, when you prepare a palette and you pr mix all these colors from your subject, you're really creating a palette that you are going to then use to modify and play with and paint your subject. So, so you would not, you don't need to remember because you're going to be checking your colors uh, even more when you're painting than you did when you were mixing colors. Say you're, you know, painting a plum and you've got the shadow of the plum and you start to paint it in, you might notice that it's, that in that little spot on the left edge, it's not quite as purple. It's slightly more uh, dirty or, or, or less, you know, less purple. And so you're going to take your purple color and you're going to put a touch of yellow in it, which is the opposite of purple, and tone it down, and then you're going to paint. So you're really just preparing a palette of colors that you're going to then play with and modify and change uh, when you actually paint. So the process of checking your colors never stops. It is especially, you're going to especially be checking uh, your values and your colors and modifying them as needed while you paint. And in that whole process, you'll become more and more familiar with them and uh, have, a, have a sense of where colors go. What do you think your career would have been if you hadn't chosen to be an artist? Um, you know, I really don't know. I think that, um, you know, where life leads you, I I at least in my own life, I've never been able to plan anything. Um, I always tend to follow one lead or, you know, how I ended up doing what I do, you know, I never would have imagined that when I was younger, that this is what I would be doing. You know, if I could change my career right now, um, you know, I, I do, I'm very happy doing what I do. I love making uh, artist oil color and easels and we're about to introduce a brush holder and I really enjoy designing that stuff. If I could really do what I wanted to do, I would probably live on a beach with some good surfing waves and have a workshop where I could make uh, furniture out of wood. That's probably what I would like to do the most right now. But I have to do uh, things that, that, that pay enough to, you know, pay all my bills. <laughs> I have always had problems trying to compare colors on photos. Could you please do a short video on how to check colors on laminated photos? Um, you know, there's really nothing to it if your lighting is set up right. I think that the two main issues that happen when people try to check colors on photos is one, uh, make sure you're working with a laminated photo or a type of uh, photograph that you can put oil paint on. You know, there are some uh, uh, printers out there that the prints, if you try to put a photo or rather oil paint on there, the dryer in the print actually will cause the paint to almost instantly become flat and matte and you can't tell so it needs to be a laminated photo um, and secondly uh, don't put such a big blob of paint that it's sticking out from the surface and catching the light different put a smear put a nice flat smear right on the uh, photograph just like this and uh, then the last thing is, is um, the glare and so it, because the photograph is a perfectly smooth glossy surface, um, it's going to reflect glare differently than a, uh, you know, bumpy painted surface. So just make sure uh, that your lighting is set up properly. If you go to um, drawmixpaint.com, I have a, a video about setting up an artist studio where I discuss how to eliminate glare and almost all the glare comes from directly behind you as you sit on your easel. So nothing bright behind you because that will throw uh, different type of glare into your paint that you're smeared on your photo 
than the photo, and so it can throw your, uh, you know, when you're trying to compare the two, it can make it more difficult. So that's about it for uh, checking on uh, colors on photos. I've mostly finished a painting only to discover a flaw in the drawing. I tried to remove some of the oil with turpentine, but a lot still remains. Is it a problem to just paint over a sizable portion of the painting? Uh, no, it's not a problem at all. It's something I did, you know, very often. I would finish a, 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 a portrait, and the client would decide that their shoulders needed to be wider, or, you know, the collar needed to be adjusted, or whatever, or, or I decided I didn't like something in the background, and I would paint over it. The only thing is, is to all, always be aware of fat, the fat over lean rule, which simply means that every layer of paint, the layer on the top, has to have a uh, slightly higher percentage of oil in it than the layer underneath. And that higher oil uh, percentage will keep the painting from drying. If you have a, paint, uh, uh, a layer of paint that's got a lot of oil in it, and then you put one on top that has a very low oil percentage, then it will crack because the one on the top is drying much faster than the one on the bottom. So that would be the only uh, rule to, so just add a few drops of, of refined linseed oil uh, to your uh, paint or cold pressed linseed oil, cold press dries a little slower, uh, to your paint that you're going to paint on top of the paint you've already painted. So uh, if you do that, you, you'll be fine. And you may want to consider oiling it out, and I've got a free video about that at Draw Mix Paint. And so go check that out, um, and that will uh, get rid of all the flat spots so you can really see what you've got uh, when you decide to repaint something. Um, but as far as uh, removing oil paint, if it's still wet, you know, you can, you can uh, just scrape it off, wipe it off, but you don't have to get every last bit of the paint off. There's nothing wrong with painting more paint into wet paint as long as uh, it's not uh, going to milk up your, your colors too much. Um, so, I hope that helps. I know that values, proportion, and edges are all important elements in a painting, but in your opinion, which of these elements is the most important in getting a painting to read well, independent of the style of painting? Um, values is always number one. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, if you look at great realism, I don't think I've ever seen realism that, that, that I love where the values are wrong, um, unless it's just something, you know, sort of modern art or, or whatever. And if you get your values right, you can almost get everything else wrong, and the painting is still going to have uh, a lot of appeal. So um, as far as uh, proportion and edges, you know, those are important. Um, you know, use a proportional divider, and that makes it real easy to get your proportions right. And as far as edges go, that's something that's a, it's all about observation. And um, you know, some edges should be soft and some edges should be hard. And it's just a matter of, of uh, you know, observing and noticing where the edges are hard and where they're soft and paint them that way. I am working from life and I'm having trouble matching colors in very small spots in a still life like the very darkest places in the yellow roses, still life in your online course. Please help me, I'm really stuck. Um, I think that there's two things here. Number one is it is very difficult to check your colors from light. From a photo, it's easy because you can put a little teeny spot and check even the smallest little area and get in there. And if you have to get a magnifying glass out, you can check it. Uh, but for working from life where your still life is four feet away from you, you know, it's really hard to look at those little spots. But what I would do is, first of all, go and, and watch the uh, video on, on how to mix colors. And in there, I, I talk about if you can't see the color, you know, in a little teeny spot, then you have to, you know, sort of do the best you can. Um, you know, move your color checker to the left, move it to the right, kind of check the area around it. But you're, you know, you don't have to be so perfect with your colors. Uh, the color checker is, is a tool that, you know, it, it works so well that you can hold it out and let's say you're checking a color in a big area where it's not hard to see. If the color is just the slightest bit off, you'll notice it. Your eye will notice it, especially if the value's off. So therefore, if you're checking the color of a little teeny spot in the shadow of something, uh, hold out your color checker and 
if it doesn't just jump out at you, I mean, if your if your color seems like it's in the in the general range of the value of the spot you're checking, you know, you may not be able to get it exact, but it's good enough. You don't have to be so so perfect with it. So just do the best you can. Check the colors around there. You know, say, well, that little teeny spot is about the same dark as this as the big shadow on the bottom of the of the you know, vase or whatever it is. So just check the, the color where the, the big spot is and just and, and do it that way. But just don't do, be too worried about it. Just do the best you can and keep going. When you get uh, your painting started to paint in and if there's a little teeny spot in there that's jumping out and you notice the value's wrong, then you can adjust it. But um, all you can do is do the best you can. It's just a lot harder uh, working from life to see little teeny spots of color and working from a Photographs not hard at all because you can just take a little detail brush and you know put a little teeny spot on there. But I hope that helps. If you want to watch more of my videos, go to drawmixpaint.com where there's a long list of all my free videos. If you're interested in art supplies, go to genevafineart.com where you'll find uh, our paint that we make right here in Austin, Texas, as well as color checkers and proportional dividers. And so that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for watching. And if you have any comments or questions for me, leave them in the comment section of this video. And uh, I'll get to as many of those questions as I can in the next episode. Welcome to Oil Painting Question and Answers, episode number 14. Uh, before I get into today's questions, I want to teach a little lesson on plotting key points. And uh, just let me first of all touch on the way that I teach is to uh, first start off, no matter what you're drawing, and put two what I call golden lines on your canvas. That's a single vertical uh, line, uh, just anywhere across your subject matter. Um, and if you're, and, and then a horizontal line. For detailed instruction on how to draw your golden lines, go to the online course at drawmixpaint.com, chapter four. And whether you're working from life or working from a photograph, uh, you'll find the instruction there on how to get your golden lines right, because it's very important. It's the foundation for all your reference. So that if you want to know where do I paint this apple, well, you measure from the golden line, you measure to the right edge of the apple, and then you go to your canvas where you've also drawn those same golden lines and you plot the left edge of the apple. Simple as that. So you start by plotting points, just like in this silver here. I've plotted all the points that I can, uh, that I can measure, and uh, especially the ones that have hard, sharp edges or sharp marks or lines that I can see very clearly. And I've plotted every one of those points measuring from the bottom golden line and from the golden line on the right and plotting each one of those points and then once I've plotted all the even in a sky like this that's pretty abstract where you don't have any you know if you look at the whole sky there's just nothing there's not any particular objects that you can put it doesn't matter but just make a few key points an edge of a cloud you know, the bottom of, of, of one cloud, the cloud over on the left, put little marks where you know where those little edges are. And if I was going to pencil this and I was going to do something abstract like this sky here, what I would do is instead of drawing in the whole sky or taking a bunch of time to measure all these points and all these lines, is I would just start off by putting in a few key points like I've indicated here and then just freehand the rest of it. Maybe by have, and, and if you'll notice, I've spread those key points out. They're not all clumped in one spot. They're just, there's one on the left, there's one on the far right, you know, there's one in the middle. And, and by having those and putting those in, it's not very hard to sort of connect the dots and get the rest of the sky painted in without really um, spending a lot of time with it. So have a few key points and that'll help you to not only uh, not lose those points as you paint, but also just to start with and to, to use those key points to draw in something abstract like this guy here. Okay, so now let's talk about portraits. And first of all, when I do portraits, instead of just having two golden lines, I will go ahead and draw in an entire box and eutrophic key points. But these little marks that I've put on the canvas 
I'm going to make really sure, number one, that I plot them correctly and that they're very accurately marked. And so that I know when I look at the artichoke and I want to know where the top of the artichoke is, I can count on that line. But just keep in mind what key points that you're plotting. And, and those points are points you never want to lose. In other words, as you start to paint the, the, the cup or a plum or the artichoke, you know, you bump the line around and next thing you know you've moved the top of the artichoke up a little bit or, or whatever it is. But if you have these key points, you can always go back and remeasure with your proportional divider. In other words, if I know where the top of the artichoke is and I've made a little mark on my canvas and you can leave a little spot of bare canvas or whatever you have to do or, you know, put a little mark with paint, but don't touch that mark and you can, that way you know exactly where the top of your artichoke is and when you're doing the rest of your still life you know you can go back to the golden lines and measure but by having that indication of where the top of the artichoke is and where the left edge of the artichoke is that tells you where does the plumb line up it tells you how much of a gap there is between the mug and the artichoke and so it's just a visual reference so let's look at this sky that I took the other day out at the uh, Geneva Fine Arts uh, paint shop and each points, then I put in a very small line indicating the angle at each one of those points. And some of those points have two angles. But once I get all the angles put in after the points, then the last thing to do, which is really not very difficult, is to put in the curves to finish the drawing. And that gives you a very simple line drawing that you can then use to paint from. That's basically how you pencil and plot points angles and curves. First points, then angles, then curves. And you don't have to do all the points and then all the angles and then draw in all the curves. What you can do is, you know, if you're painting an eye, for instance, you may plot four points and then draw a little bit of a curve in and just go ahead and finish the eye. But in general, I like to plot all the points, then the angles, and then the curves. And by the way, you can use your proportion divider to check angles like I talk about in this clip here. You guys know how to check an angle with one of these? You just hold it out. This one's vertical, and this one checks the angle, right? This one's vertical, and this one, you got a book sitting on a table. I want to know what that angle is. Come over here, draw it in, check it. Okay, so now what about key points? Key points are a little different. If you take a look at this still life here, um, I've plotted a few what I think are key points and and you could there's you know you could pick a different set it doesn't have to be these but can make maybe the left line and the bottom line be your real hard solid golden lines and then put in the other two just as reference but by having that box it really helps and notice where I put the box right above the eyebrows right underneath the chin and then just on the left side and right side of her face and those lines are really my solid golden line that I can trust. And if I lose my likeness later, I can always go back and look at my golden line. So I always try to leave a little bit of the golden line and don't paint over the whole thing so I can maintain that visual reference. But now let's look at the face. You don't have to pick the exact same uh, key points that I have here, but I've tried to zoom in on the real essential ones. And this is all about getting a likeness. You know, you can pencil so many different ways. You don't even have to use my method for penciling with golden lines. But, but if you're, when you're doing a portrait, it is unlike anything else because you have to get this likeness. And it is so easy. If the eye, if you paint the eye just a millimeter to the left or to the right uh, from where it should be, the likeness will be off. So especially in a portrait, uh, through my uh, long career painting portraits where it was getting a likeness was so important. Um, you know, the client would never be happy if the likeness was even the slightest bit off. So I would always